I regret to inform everybody that there has been a theft in the office. My last bag of Sun Chips is missing, and I was hoping to have the Harvest Cheddar flavor with lunch, but they have disappeared. I, I don't know anything about this. I'll just come out right right now and say that. So where are those Sun Chips? Answer the question, please. Are you responsible? If you're not responsible, who is? Who do we, who do we look to for leadership if no one takes responsibility? Who do we look to for leadership if nobody owns up to the sun chip theft? Honestly, good cop, hangry cop with Dave Riker was not on my bingo card for this morning, but I'll roll with it. Jeannie, buckle up, because this show does go to unexpected places. Crispy, savory, sometimes unsavory places. It's time for Sound Politics. Welcome to Sound Politics, the show about the people and policies that affect your future in Washington State. I'm KUOW's Libby Denkman, and oh my god, you're not Scott Greenstone. Who are you? It's true. It's true. I'm not. And we like to stick to the truth, so I'll admit I'm Jeannie Lindsay. Jeannie Lindsay, KUOW state government reporter. Thank you for being here while Scott's away. He's probably not having any fun at all without us wishing he was back at work. Yeah, I got a note that he's not checking email, and I imagine if he's on a beach, he's really not trying to come back here anytime soon. (laughs) Poor guy. It is great to have you here today, especially because we are going to get really, really wonky, like in the nitty gritty, so far in the weeds, you cannot see the road anymore kind of wonky. We're going to dive into the Climate Commitment Act and the initiative aimed at virtually repealing it, I-2117. Yeah, listeners can't see this, but I have got my best safari gardening outfit on because I am ready (laughs) for this foray into the weeds. Let's do it. Those Coke bottle glasses look really good on you, too. Um, (laughs) So quickly before we dive in, it was showdown part duh last night for the two men who want to be Washington's next governor. My big takeaway is that I want whatever the audience at the Fox Theater in Spokane was served last night because they were a rowdy bunch. They were getting into it. Um, It was like a hockey game more than a political debate. Any big headlines for you, Jeannie, out of this? Yeah. I mean, Democrat Bob Ferguson and Republican Dave Reichert, they were at it again, covering a lot of ground, mostly talking about small business stuff, economic issues, a lot of talk about deregulation and who would be the biggest, quote unquote, change agent, which they've been using that phrase a lot. They sparred over climate policy a bit, which I was thinking was relevant for what we're talking about today. Reichert called out gas prices specifically and said the state needs to move away from fossil fuels, which I was surprised to hear from him. But uh, he didn't want to set a time frame to do that. And then Ferguson said, you know, he would follow the science, talked about climate policy and that being, you know, something to focus on for creating new jobs. And uh, I almost didn't realize it, but Donald Trump was not mentioned, I think, a single time, which which is a very big difference from the first debate when Donald Trump was almost like a third candidate in the room. Yeah, not a single time, which is it's remarkable. Yeah. Compared with Ferguson really trying to tie Reichert to that last week, Reichert saying, I'm not going to vote for the guy. Um, I wonder if Donald Trump was sad about that because he does like to be the main story. And I do want to say, like, that Reichert move to say, I believe that we need to move off of fossil fuels, I see that happening a lot with the folks who want to repeal the Climate Commitment Act. They do not want to be painted with the climate change denier brush that I think the uh, no campaign on 2117 is trying to use in some of its ads. So let's get to the big story, because it's about that, uh, Jeannie. You and I both have been digging in on one of the most consequential choices that voters are facing this year. It's Initiative 2117. We're going to see that on the ballot this November. It would end the state's carbon auctions that are the key part of the Climate Commitment Act passed by the legislature in 2021. Now, supporters of the CCA, so these are opponents of 2117, they say human-caused climate change is an existential threat. And the only way that we are going to be reaching the state's goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2050 is by making big polluters pay for the climate warming stuff that they pump into the atmosphere. Yeah. And meanwhile, the repeal campaign isn't really talking about the climate or climate change. They've done a really good job of tying this law with high gas prices. But I mean, they still have a lot of work to do before Election Day because they're not outright winning in the polls at this point. And so it's going to be really crucial for them to sway those undecided folks. And I mean, so far, this fight has been boiled down to climate change versus gas prices. But as we're about to talk about, it is so much more complicated than that. Yeah. And a bit about how we got here. 
So these Climate Commitment Act auctions, they launched in 2023. That means that the biggest carbon emitters, about 100 or so large companies in the state, particularly fuel suppliers, utilities, they started to have to purchase carbon allowances, which are like permission slips for each metric ton of carbon that they emit. These auctions now happen every few months. Uh, Last year, the state netted about $1.8 billion in revenue from them. This year so far, the allowance prices are down. Auctions have raised about $480 million. And that revenue is already getting spent by the legislature. It's going to green energy projects, electric ferries, $200 rebates for low-income folks to help with their utility bills, etc. But as we have alluded to, the Climate Commitment Act is not universally beloved. Many people blame it for driving up costs. So, Jeannie, this is where I-2117 comes in. Walk us through the reasoning behind it. I mean, the cost of living, Libby, in the famous words of Jimmy McMillan, is too damn high. (laughs) And so the rollout of the carbon auctions coincided with higher gas prices. In 2022, pre-CCA, Washington broke records for gas prices, and then those went back down. And then in 2023, when CCA started, gas prices went up again. And so people were already feeling squeezed by housing and grocery costs. Coming out of a pandemic, people were stressed out and pissed off at the government. And so there's just this frustration around affordability and then frustration with the government. And then you think about how are people actually seeing, you know, the price that they're paying at the pump translate to what they're getting for it? So prices have gone up and the frustration is is real. And we should say that the refrain from no on I-2117, the people who want to save the Climate Commitment Act, it's that it's not a perfect bill. When I talked to State House Majority Leader Joe Fitzgibbons about this, he did acknowledge that There were issues with exemptions for farmers, for example, on the fees that fuel companies pass on to consumers. You know, it turns out there's no way at a gas pump to say, hey, I'm a farmer. Don't charge me the extra uh, amount of money that the fuel companies are passing down to customers. But he does think it can be improved through the regular legislative process. That's what you hear from a lot of these folks who want to keep the auctions. Yeah. And that's pretty typical with any major program rollout. You know, there are flaws or, you know, frustrations or challenges with the implementation. Lawmakers come back and fix that. Uh, But the things that farmers are feeling right now, they are the ones affected by climate change. And then they're also being squeezed by gas prices. And so they're really sort of in this no win situation, which just adds to the frustration we were just talking about. So I do want to get to some of these arguments that I-2117 supporters make. And we're going to go piece by piece on this. First up, what do we really know about gas prices? That is a big question. How have they actually been affected by the Climate Commitment Act? Because it's been a headache to try to parse this, for me at least. Well, it is so incredibly difficult to pinpoint any sort of exact, precise number. The best thing we can do is really talk about estimates. And so the best estimates that I've seen and heard and talked with folks about range between about 20 to 40 cents per gallon at the pump. But again, gas prices change every day, basically. And it depends on the corner gas station that you buy fuel at, that can range a couple of cents depending on which side of the street you're on, let alone which part of the state you're in. So the 20 to 40 estimates is sort of the sweet spot, I'd say, of the impact here. And the reality is that if the repeal is successful, gas prices likely will come down some, to some degree. We don't know what degree that will happen because it's ultimately up to the businesses who sell you gas to decide. And I think the other side of this, though, is that it's important to point out that Washington gas prices are always high. The western coast of the United States always has high gas prices than everybody else, along with Hawaii and Alaska. And so even if the gas prices in Washington state on average drop by a 40 cents per gallon, Washington will still have around the fifth highest average cost of fuel in the country. Like, that's just a fact. We will not be out of the top 10. And again, like I was saying, and like we pointed out earlier, Washington's gas prices broke records in 2022 pre-CCA. We still have not gotten to that number. And just zooming all the way out, gas prices are up everywhere. Like, it is not something that is just unique to Washington, but 
the newly implemented CCA is a new thing here. Yeah. Folks who want to keep the Climate Commitment Act, who do not want you to vote yes on 2117, they say it is impossible to parse exactly how much it affected gas prices. But it is interesting that they've moved away from straight up saying it would not affect gas prices the way that Governor Inslee had said before the Climate Commitment Act came into effect. Um, The one big metric that I think is useful to look at is Oregon prices. And if you watch the graph of where Oregon's gas prices, which traditionally tracked Washington's, uh, were moving up until 2023 when the auctions came into effect, you do see a separation and that the Washington prices went higher than Oregon's. And it's timed pretty closely with when the auctions uh, came online. Two of the arguments from 2117, I think we should take together because they're kind of uh, related issues. That's this question about whether the carbon auctions and all of these green projects they fund are going to work at all and whether we will know if they will work. Because, hey, fun fact, the state's most recent carbon emissions data is from 2019. Like it is five years out of date. Uh, Todd Myers at the Washington Policy Center, who supports the initiative, told me he thinks that this is because the state wants to hide the data because it's embarrassing. Um, we didn't find any evidence of that. My producer at Soundside, Hans Anderson, asked the State Department of Ecology about this. And they say the delay in reporting is due to a lag in federal data. They're not hiding anything. They're still crunching local numbers. But they know that it's taking a long time. They get asked about this a lot. Even when they do release this next batch of figures, Jeannie, it's only going to be for those early pandemic years. So we are not going to know anything about the first couple years of the carbon auctions when people actually vote on things in November. Needless to say, that's a pain, frankly, for both sides, because they both talk past each other about the effectiveness of these uh, policies. Yeah, this data would be incredibly helpful to have, regardless of which side you're on. Yeah. And I should say that most carbon pricing systems, there's been research on this, they do cut emissions. So it's not as though this is a first of its kind program that has no precedent. We don't know what happens. There have been places all over the world, China, the EU, British Columbia, who have put a price on carbon. And there has been a reduction in emissions over time. It would, of course, be really nice to have the data from here in Washington state. Um, I think we should address a big pushback from the no on 2117 folks. Again, these are the people who want to keep the carbon auctions. And Their pushback is just how badly the state's budget would be messed up if the repeal initiative passes and the carbon auction revenue goes away. And I've seen it on the No Campaign website and ads. They're saying that the initiative is going to take money away from transportation projects like roads and bridges. And that's a big thing for people who are looking at our crumbling infrastructure and saying, hey, I don't want to take money away from the places I drive. So what is the Yes campaign saying, Jeannie? The Yes campaign has a big issue with any talk about roads and bridge funding when it comes to the Climate Commitment Act. But the reality is, and this is like where I put on my conspiracy gardener hat because we're about to get into the weeds even deeper. (laughs) But like it's all connected. Right. So just getting into the history of this, when Washington state passes a multi-year transportation package, they do them every decade or so. It usually comes with a gas tax increase. The latest one, it's called the Move Ahead Washington Package. It's 16 years worth of transportation projects, billions of billions of dollars. It did include some vehicle fee increases. um, But the Climate Commitment Act, these carbon auctions, is supposed to pay for a third of that package, $5.4 billion about. And part of that money goes to ferries, bike lanes, um, you know, free bus rides for kids. And some of that stuff is not as, I'm just going to say, essential per se, big quotation marks there. You know, bike lanes won't get you to the islands. Ooh, um, you're going to have the bi- bike people calling you, Jeannie. <laughs> Yikes. Like, like they, I'm not saying they're not important, but like the ferry system is in crisis, right? And we need new ferries in sure. Washington. Sure, Jeannie Lindsay anti-bike. Yeah, move and on. Part- go, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no. Um, but like... The, the legislature is going to have to reshuffle that entire transportation package if a third of it goes away because of the way that the dollars are broken up. And so the money will be shuffled around and that could put maybe some less immediate needs at risk potentially. Um, but 
there's also just a budget crisis in the transportation area overall. Like projects are already getting more expensive. Gas tax revenues are not bringing in as much money to the state budget. And then on top of that, you know, Republicans are saying this idea of like shuffling money around to fill any gaps in transportation. But Climate Commitment Act money also goes to other parts of the state budget. And so if you take away the whole carbon emissions auctions, it's a lot harder to shuffle money around when everybody's budget just tightened up by billions of dollars. And so the legislature, it seems like a natural response would be tax increases. Like cuts are inevitable if the CCA goes away. That's just true. But the natural response from Democrats who lead the legislature would be to find new revenue, a.k.a. taxes. And that's like the unsexiest conversation you can have in a massively important political climate election year like we're in right now. Yeah. And it's not as though Republicans mainly who want to repeal the CCA are going to want to look for more revenue. Um, And generally, when you ask where the cuts can come, people don't want to talk specifics. They say, oh, there's going to be an audit, waste, fraud and abuse, but you don't actually see anything materialize. Ginny, we can't go through a conversation about this without addressing the libertarian elephant in the room, the primary funder of getting this initiative and two others on the ballot. It's Brian Haywood. He's a hedge fund manager. He moved to the state a little over a decade ago from California He likes freedom and and low taxes. So we connect this initiative to a rich guy. But what does the fundraising picture really look like for the yes and the no on 2117 campaigns? I mean, there's a lot of rich people involved, it turns out, including a few billionaires on the no side. Overall, there's a big fundraising difference between Let's Go Washington and the no campaign folks. Let's Go Washington is holding these gas prices slashing events, again, tying the CCA to gas prices, but they don't have nearly as much fundraising. So it's really unclear what the strategy is for the no campaigns at this point. They've held different press conferences and, you know, door knocking and things like that. Um, But, you know, we're coming in on a month away from ballots going out and they can't pump smog into a room and say this is what's going to happen if the repeal wins, unlike, you know, Let's Go Washington, which can go to gas stations and keep that conversation going. Yeah, it's a so, little bit of an easier bumper sticker message the Yes campaign right. has. Um, I wonder when we will see, again, those the superior fundraising numbers for the No campaign materializing, like more TV ads. What, you know, what is it going to look like? What about polling, Jeannie? What are you seeing? Yeah, the latest poll uh, from Cascade PBS, Stuart Elway, you know, there's diminishing support for the Climate Commitment Act initiative 2117 among the people who responded. But there are still a lot of people who are undecided. Um, And so, you know, it seems like a larger share of people who have decided would reject the repeal. But there are still a lot of people who just haven't made up their mind. And so this next month is going to be critical because this is when more regular people, I guess, start actually paying closer attention to all of this. Yeah. 24 percent undecided in that Stuart Elway poll. That is remarkable. Again, we are going to be seeing a big sprint to the finish for both of these campaigns to try to make their cases to voters. Really quick, I'm going to lean back. I'm going to get my pipe. I'm going to have a big takeaway moment here, Jeannie, get a little philosophical about this. The more that I talk to the players who are involved in the yes and the no campaigns on 2117 and, you know, the people who want to keep the Climate Commitment Act, the people who want to get rid of it, I think that this vote is really going to boil down to whether people believe in state government at a fundamental level. Because this is about the state spending billions on a huge action plan to try and curb the effects of climate change. And yes, it has made gas more expensive to fund that plan. Big, bold investments in transit, electric ferries, etc. I do wonder if that choice had been clearly laid out for people right away that this was going to be a thing that the state would do and your gas prices would go up a little bit. But if you believe in our ability to fight climate change, then, you know, you would be on board with that. I also think that the Yes campaign on 2117, it's somewhat disingenuous when they say, hey, we believe that climate change is a threat, but this isn't the right policy. Let's go back to the drawing board. Because it took more than 10 years to pass a carbon pricing system in Washington state. 
this started in 2009 when they tried to pass a cap and trade uh, system. So if the Climate Commitment Act is repealed this time around, who knows how long it might take for an alternative to be put in place. So I do you previously, Jeannie, kind of boiled this down to gas prices or fighting climate change. I do think that that is the real choice here. And that's what people are going to be weighing. Well, and really, a lot of this feels like timing and messaging issues, right? Like, people want to know that if their gas prices are going up, they're getting something for that payment, like for for that money. Mm -hmm. And then on top of it, this is all coming after a generation defining trauma, the COVID-19 pandemic, when a lot of people were really unhappy with the government. And so I'm just wondering, I, I think about this all the time, like, could this, would this repeal even be happening if we were in a different political environment that was not nearly as fraught in the era of Trump, uh, if it was presented differently in a different health, political or economic landscape, maybe this would have landed a lot differently for people. It is not easy to sum this up in a short amount of time. And Jeannie, thank you for going out on this safari into the weeds with me and trying to bring back some facts for people, trying to bring back some analysis. I've appreciated it so much. Thank you for being Scott today. It's It's been awesome. It was certainly an adventure. Thanks for having me here. <laughs> Jeannie Lindsay is the state government reporter for KUOW. And that's it for Sound Politics this week. Today's Sound Politics was produced by Sarah Leibovitz. It was edited by Katherine Smith. I'm Libby Denkman. Scott Greenstone will be back next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. And this show is only possible because of donations like the one from Samantha in Everett. Thank you so much, Samantha, for giving to support Sound Politics and all the podcasts at KUOW. You can go to KUOW.org slash politics to join Samantha and keep our podcast going strong. And hey, we want to know your thoughts so far. Share your feedback or questions at soundpolitics at KUOW.org. You can also leave us a good old-fashioned voicemail at 206-221-0511. See you next week, everybody. Thank you.